Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for waiting. Um, Technology is wonderful until it doesn't work, but I believe the wait will be worth it to all of us. Um, welcome to the Prescribing Task Force meeting. As you know, if you've been here before, I'm Michael Bishop. I'm an anesthesiologist, and I'm also co-chair of this committee with my fellow board member, Barbara Yaroslavsky. I want to reiterate the mission of this task force, which is to identify ways to proactively approach and find solutions to the epidemic of prescription drug overdoses in this state through education, prevention, best practices, communication, and outreach by engaging all stakeholders in this endeavor with a vision to significantly reduce prescription drug overdoses. <coughs> Again, thank you for being here today. I would like to now turn things over to my fellow uh, board, medical board member and past president, Barbara Arslowski. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I'm a public member for the Medical Board of California, and today our goal is to finalize the board's guidelines for prescribing controlled substances for pain. Since the last meeting, we've received a tremendous amount of feedback. We received feedback from experts in the field, organizations and associations, other state agencies, and several other entities. All feedback was reviewed, and in most instances, it was incorporated into the newest version of the guidelines. We would estimate over 80% of the comments were put into the document. So you can see the quality of the feedback we received. In addition, the staff has reviewed other state medical boards guidelines and incorporated several suggestions from these documents. After staff prepared the version that was sent out on September 16th, they met with an expert in pain management and also an expert in emergency medicine and made additional edits to the document. This new revision was posted on the board's website and emailed out to those on the task force mailing list on Thursday, September 25th. So I hope you all have the uh, most uh, current version. I believe there's copies in the back for those that do not. As Ms. Yaroslavsky stated, our goal today is to receive final comments and then put this on the document as we will be taking it to the October Medical Board meeting for review and approval. So we look forward to your feedback today in our final version of the guidelines. Ms. Sweet and Ms. Robinson are here with us today and they're going to be walking us through this document. They will describe what changed between the version sent on uh, September 16th and the one sent on September 29th. They will be taking notes and will revise the document with agreed upon comments from today um, prior to taking it to the October board meeting. Before we begin going through our guidelines, I would like to take the opportunity to ask the Executive Medical Director of the Division of Workers' Compensation, Dr. Das, which I saw a minute ago, she's, uh, thank you, um, to briefly discuss the status of the guidelines <laughs> that the Division of Workers' Comp compensation is putting together. Board staff here has reviewed the uh, division's draft guidelines and ensured that our information did not contradict. We understand that we need two different documents, but we also want to ensure that we are providing non-conflicting information. We have linked to their guidelines in our document, but also know that the division is going through the regulatory process and will this will ensure more recent guidelines are the ones the board links to its guidelines. Dr. Das, would you uh, let us know what the status is? Would you like to come forward, please? He's got a mic behind you. <laughs> you might want to just pretend like you're in lecture hall. Uh, get attached. Get wired up. He's a stalker. You just talk and right. walk uh, around the room. It's fine. Good morning. Whatever you good like. afternoon. <laughs> My name is Rupali Das, and I'm the executive medical director of the Division of Workers, Co Workers Compensation. I'm an internist and occupational medicine physician. And I'm grateful that Director Kirkmeyer asked me to speak to you today. Uh, I think coordination is really critical to avoid confusion and provide high quality care. The Division of Workers' Compensation Opioid Treatment Guidelines are part of what's called the Medical Treatment Utilization Schedule, or MTUS. These are evidence-based guidelines for use when treating work-related illness and injury in California and were mandated by the legislature in 2004. Uh, the guidelines in general are developed based on advisory input from an expert physician panel, after which they go through a public comment process and are set in regulation. They are presumed to be correct, except that they are rebuttable based on a higher level of scientific evidence. So getting to the opioid guidelines, currently, because the opioid guidelines are not set in regulation, guidelines on the use of opioids in the workers' compensation system is in the chronic pain treatment guidelines. These are based on the official disability guidelines published by the Work Loss Disability Institute, uh, we, based on ODG as we know it. Uh, starting in 2012, due to the epidemic of prescription drug misuse, 
we began work on the opioid guidelines. And the uh, Medical Evidence Ad Evaluation Advisory Committee started a subcommittee to look at this topic. We, because of resource constraints, we did not do an original literature search. We based our guidelines on other existing guidelines. We, we reviewed the high several high quality guidelines, including those from Canada, the VA, and uh, other organizations and, and states. The recommendations are derived from the best evidence in these guidelines, and are, uh, most of them are evidence-based but also consensus-based. So current status of these guidelines is that in April of this year, they were posted for an informal period, a 10-day period. It's called a forum posting. We did receive comments at that time, but we don't, we're not required to respond to those comments because it's an informal period. However, we did incorporate many of the comments and made many changes to improve the document, not substantively, but, um, but they, are, they are improvements. We will soon be revising, uh, posting a revised version for a 45-day public comment period simultaneously with the revised version of the chronic pain guidelines because the two currently overlap and we don't want them to contradict each other or to duplicate each other. <coughs> we also compared the guidelines from the medical board and our guidelines and I'm, I'm really happy to say that overall they're very consistent. There are a few differences which I considered due to the different populations that they address. Ours address workers, and the medical board guidelines address a much broader and different population. So that's to be expected that there are going to be some differences. That comparison also uh, is going to trigger us going back to our guidelines to make sure that we didn't miss anything and that, um, that that doesn't account for some of the differences that we found when we compared the guidelines. So uh, to summarize, expect a 45-day public comment period document to come out within the next couple of months. That's our goal. At that time, uh, we will have a, a public meeting like this one in Oakland. At some point during that 45-day period, we will accept oral and written comments. And that starts the formal rulemaking process. We do have to respond in writing to each of the comments. And then we make our uh, revisions based on the input and our judgment. Thank you again for allowing me to say a few words and I look forward to continuing to work with you. No, thank you very much for helping us with this process. Uh, now I'd like to turn this over to Ms. Sweet and Ms. Robinson who are going to walk us through the document. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. What we'd like to do is go section by section, and then after we discuss the changes that have been made, and we, we've actually going to highlight the changes that have been made uh, between the June version and uh, today's version, and we'd like to stop after each sec section and invite public comment at that time. So starting with the document, the working title we had uh, used at the June a meeting was called pain management guidelines and we have more correctly now titled the document guidelines for prescribing controlled substances for pain does anybody have anything they would like to say about that okay moving on to the preamble we made quite a few changes to this section based upon the the outstanding comments that we received we refined some of the language regarding the accidental deaths being solely attributable to prescription medications and or the perception that only aberrant use leads to accidental overdoses. We also clarified the intent of the guidelines, that they do not prescribe the standard of care, that the focus is the long-term use of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. We added that there are other options for treatment of pain other than opioids. We recognize that deviations from the guidelines will occur. We added a CMA, California Medical Association, quotation that opioids are widely accepted as appropriate and effective for the alleviation of moderate to severe acute pain, cancer pain, and persistent end-of-life pain. We added additional clarification regarding the standard of care and how experts arrive at its determination. And to address the concern that some of the appendices can contradicted others, we stress that the board merely wants to include a variety of sources of information to assist physicians and that the board is not necessarily endorsing any particular treatment strategy. Would anybody like to make comments on the preamble? Yes. Paragraph 
2013, the CDC and prevention declared prescription abuse to be a nationwide epidemic. The correct date is November of 2011. Uh, and I have for you that documentation from the CDC vital signs, which I'll hand over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the so understanding pain. Let me ask you a question. Oh, sure. Okay. So in the fourth paragraph, where you, they are not intended to prescribe the standard of care, is the term prescribed, I know, is the correct use, but does it, we're talking about prescription drugs and overprescribing and prescribing, are we over, does the word prescribing, I'm, I don't want a wordsmith, but. We can find another word for, right. for prescribe. Thank you. And one, one additional thing I, I think we will be also modifying a little bit is there have been questions whether or not these guidelines will supersede previous guidelines, and we will make that a little bit clearer in the next or hopefully final revision. Okay, the understanding pain section, we really didn't change any, any verbiage whatsoever, but we did fix a formatting issue. Uh, we did not bullet it correctly, so we changed that, so that was an easy fix. Does anybody have any comments regarding this particular section? Yes. <laughs> so um, I, I, you all have to understand I'm coming from the patient's perspective as well as from a public member perspective, not from a medical perspective, uh, though I have some experience with pain. Um, it's assumed that doctors have a conversation with their patients, and in asking for a... Um, a discussion of this, I just want to make clear that there is, even though it's not stated that within the um, structure of a treatment plan, that that structure of a treatment plan will be written as well as verbal. I mean, I don't know that it needs, I'm just not looking to nitpick, but I just want to make sure that someone is not being handed a piece of paper, say read it and, and fill it out, or it, that there's some kind of a interactive discussion. Because when we've had issues with, issues of uh, standard of care and discipline issues, it's because of a lack of a conversation and a lack of a written documentation. So I, I'm, I'm looking at this from a perspective of how can we keep the doctors out of harm's way or out of issues or out of discipline or out of, so I don't know that it's necessary. And I'm, I just wanted to raise the issue and you think about it. Okay. Okay, moving on to special patient populations. We actually move this section so that it precedes the patient evaluation and risk stratification section because we think this makes better sense. We also added the statement that the guidelines are intended to particularly address the use of opioids in the long-term treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. Within this section, under the acute pain subset, we again emphasized that numerous but not all of the recommendations cited in the guidelines may not be relevant for the phys physician treating a pain, patient excuse me, for acute pain. Within this section under the emergency department subset, we made corrections so the guidelines more correctly reflect the American College of Emergency Physicians clinical policy. We emphasized a more relevant ER dilemma patients presenting to the ER with acute exacerbation of chronic non-cancer pain. Within the end of life subset, we added the words, quote, in addition to relieving suffering, end quote, after improving maintaining a patient's overall quality of life. Within the pediatric subset, we exchanged the word pediatric, excuse me, we exchanged pediatric for the word adolescent so that it, there was no question it, in, it also included young, younger patients than adolescents. Within the patients covered by workers' compensation subset, we included a link to the Division of worker, Workers' Compensation Guidelines for the use of opioids to treat work-related injuries. Within the patients with history of substance use disorder, we added links to cures, and we also linked the opioid risk tool Within the patients prescribed benzodiazepine subset, we added a link for phys physicians looking for information on tapering or withdrawal from benzodiazepines. And then we added a subset entitled patients prescribed methadone uh, buprenorphine for treatment of a substance use disorder and added an informational link. And between the two September versions, we uh, clarified some of the verbiage in that, that subset 
in order to make it read a little bit better. Are there any comments regarding this particular section? Okay. Sir? Thank you, David Ford. Um, I represent the Organized Oncologists. And I, first of all, I want to thank the board for the work you've done in here to lay out the differences in cancer pain and non-cancer pain. Obviously, it's very important to the physicians that I represent. Um, and my understanding is that these guidelines, you know, especially with the, the one passage that you referenced, that these guidelines are intended to uh, apply to non-cancer pain. Um, I, my clients, however, in reviewing the document, did think that could be more explicitly stated, especially in the section on page five <coughs> that references cancer pain. Just reiterate that these guidelines are, intent, are not intended to, uh, to apply to cancer pain. Um, we think that, uh, and we, as you rightly noted, cancer is very different, and um, very rarely will people question uh, pain management for patients who are dying of cancer. Thank you. Dr. Levine? Uh, Sharon Levine, medical board member and pediatrician. In the paragraph on pediatric patients, I have some concern about the statement, additionally risk of opioid misuse should be low. I'm not sure what that means. And um, given, given that there's a dramatic, I'd say, variation in what is considered pediatric patients, um, pediatricians now treat um, young people up to the uh, age of 18, 20, 18 yeah. sometimes 21. And so I, I'm not sure what the, okay. that there's a need for that first f first part of that sentence. It would suggest taking it out and just gotcha. kind of say close monitoring and consultation. And you might want to be specific about consultation with whom um, should be undertaken if children are started on opioids. Sharon, are you, are you referring also close monitoring of perhaps the parents or caregivers? I mean, seriously, that and family, right? So are you suggesting, though, that the first part, extreme caution, should be used in prescribing opioids for adolescents be removed or, re or retained and, and adding the section? Just taking out the words. The risk of opioid mis misuse should, should be low. Be low. Yeah. Okay, you're taking, the, it's the last sentence, not the first sentence. The sentence. Okay. The first part of the last sentence. Right. Should be low. And just start with a close monitoring or consultation. Yeah, okay. Another question, sir? My name is Bill Bros. I'm an anesthesia pain specialist down in uh, the Bay Area. I had a question regarding the workers' compensation section. Um, in the first paragraph, it describes that if recovery or healing doesn't occur as expected, early triage and appropriate timely treatment is essential to restore function and facilitate return to work. In the workers' compensation guidelines and in the management of workers' compensation patients, we have an issue where when the patient does not return to work and we're looking at prolonged care that's being provided under workers' compensation, the guidelines still seem to be more focused on reducing or eliminating the use of these drugs and wouldn't be as compatible with these guidelines. Uh, for the chronic long-term management of patients where I see these guidelines being more <coughs> liberal. Thank you. Can you fix that? So what are you recommending? What are you suggesting? I was wondering whether you could consider an additional sentence after the facilitate return to work that said something um, akin to if a return to work is not um, attainable, um, and based on some language around the resolution of indemnity, but continued medical treatment is going to be provided under workers' compensation that these guidelines that we're now reviewing would be applicable. 
So that if a worker, I just want to repeat what you said so I understand and everyone else understands, you're suggesting that a statement be added that would suggest that a person who is being treated under workman's comp situation and is not able to return to work, that then the doctor following the patient would fall under the guidelines that are currently used for chronic pain. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Yang. I'm an emergency physician from Los Angeles. I have a, a, a number of things about this whole section. Okay. So uh, the first one is the risk of opioid, under the pediatric uh, section. I agree that the risk of opioid misuse should be low. A uh, portion should be taken out, but for an entirely different reason. It's because 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, and 16-year-olds are the most likely to have pill parties. So just because you give them narcotic and they're technically pediatric by our medical definition doesn't mean that they're any less likely to abuse um, prescription medication. So I think you should take that out so that people remember that there can be just as high risk for lack of knowledge of anything else. Um, a second thing I would mention is um, uh, the portion under the emergency department to enhance patient education. Many EDs, urgent care and primary care clinics now post safe pain medicine prescribing rules in their lobbies. This is actually very wrong. Um, most EDs initially started doing that and they've taken it down. The reason is because in January 2013, CMS issued a memo originating out of South Carolina that said that posting signs in the lobby or treatment areas can be considered EMTALA violations because these signs can be coercive and discourage patients from seeking care because they are not qualified to differentiate acute life-threatening pain from their usual pain. So the central office in Baltimore actually upheld the South Carolina <coughs> office's decision. Um, I have the memo, and I can forward that to you if you like. Yes. But uh, we should not encourage EDs to post that in the lobby um, or treatment areas because the obligation of an emergency physician is to rule out an emergency medical condition, and sometimes it takes the entire Where ED visit for that to happen, not in the lobby. Um, the uh, third point um, that I have is under the ASEP guidelines, uh, they, the ASEP guidelines in general are, are pretty broad. Um, there are many county uh, nationwide there are many county-initiated uh, guidelines that are more stringent and more specific about the type of scheduled uh, medications that, be, that can be safely prescribed from the ED because they are, these patients generally are not monitored and there is no guarantee of follow-up. So Los Angeles County DHS actually created a set of guidelines that is distributed to every emergency department in Los Angeles County and every ED is handing out these guidelines upon discharge to their patients. But one of the, a uh, couple of the guidelines that should be addressed is the fact that ED physicians, sh specifically ED physicians, should not refill stolen prescriptions. If a patient reports that they are stolen, the police should be called and a report filed. Um, if the prescription is lost, the ED physician should not prescribe them. And this all goes in line with the fact that there should be one provider with, who's doing all the prescriptions to ensure safety and uh, close monitoring of these chronic uh, opioid therapy. Um, additionally, there should be uh, uh, ED physicians should not prescribe long-acting pain medications such as MS Cotton, Opana, Methadone, uh, Suboxone, Subitex, fentanyl patches. These are not appropriate for management of acute pain, which is what ED physicians are specialized in. So you're actually asking them to operate outside of their scope of practice by, so I think you should put a note in there to discourage that practice. Not that it's not impossible or inappropriate and it's not a never situation, but discouraging those types of prescriptions from the emergency department. Before you go on, would you, would you consider um, that we should actually have a link to those, specifically reference that in our documents, that that's available uh, immediately yeah. to any physician that's looking sure. at Sure. And I think just a couple sentences just to highlight that, because you don't want any hospital or emergency department to open themselves up to an EMTALA or just the risk of um, prescribing something when a one sentence, like you should not prescribe long-acting uh, medications, generally speaking. Um, and then you could put the link to that. But I have a copy also of the DHS guidelines. It's 10 very simple rules. The, a lot of them are common sense. One of them being please check cures. 
um, asking for picture ID if a patient is given a prescription for a narcotic to verify that it actually is the person in the same address that they provided at registration, um, just to ensure from beginning to end. So I have a list of that as well. So before you go away, I, I just have a question given your, the opportunity to question you since you're sitting here. I had in my notes that ED doctors should not be giving prescriptions or prescribing prescriptions medicine for longer than one day to a work, to the next work day. So that even though we have less than a day, less than a week on our guidelines, and I understand it's hard to see doctors. I mean, that's, there are lots of doctors around in my opinion, but it seems to me that patients that are receiving these kinds of medications should have a relationship with their doctor or with a practice that they're not going to have to wait a week to see a, a doctor. So if they have to go to the emergency room because they've done, uh, broken an arm or broken, you know, something that the doctor in the emergency room is treating, it seems to me that giving a week opportunity is, is longer than maybe necessary. And asking the ED doctor to prescribe for a week or less is maybe more than the ED doctor might feel comfortable about doing given that they are not the primary care physician. Right. What do you think about that? Um, I think when we write these guidelines, I think that's a concern of a lot of the, of the people here is that you don't want to dictate care to your providers, right? right. Everyone, I think a lot of physicians and uh, even um, mid-level providers take a little bit of offense of being told what they can and cannot do. Um, so with these guidelines, what we found is that instead of putting a number to it, one week, three days, 10 okay. pills, mm -hmm. what we say is if pain prescriptions are needed, we will give you a limited amount. And so it establishes up front that it's not a free-for-all, as well as the fact that it's in the clinician's best judgment what is appropriate, given the situation. The average patient that I see can't see their doctor for months, regardless of the Affordable Care Act. Um, they have a card. They hold the card. Their primary care physician's name is printed on it. They can't see that doctor for a long time. So saying that they only get a day of pills and they're on their own, I feel a little bad about it. Um, so if I give them a week, I feel a little better, but that's that particular patient. Um, if I know it's a patient who's seen a pain specialist before, then I don't have no qualms either giving zero prescription or that's, one day. I was going with that. <laughs> I was not going with the person that just walks into the ER. I'm, I'm right. going with the patient that is already an existing patient of a pain management kind of a situation, doctor. Right. Sometimes you can verify. It, it's just tough to dictate a number. That's okay. All. No, I so can appreciate that. We, uh, the language you try to say is just that, you know, up front, it's a limited amount. It's not going to be the amount that you request. It's not the amount that you typically get. It's going to be a limited <coughs> amount. And I, we've, we found that to be fair because it sets up an expectation with a limitation, yet it leaves the provider ample room to do as they feel is necessary. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. No, it does. It does. It's very clear. Did you? Okay. Thank you very much. Did Did you have any other comments you wanted to give? Had? Uh, no, I think the, those are enough. Okay, sir. So, thank you. Um, my name is Tom Sugarman. I'm the uh, past president of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, and I really thank the board and. Um, Ms. Uh, Sweet and Ms. Robinson for all the work they've done on improving this, and I think it's a vast improvement over what we saw in June, so I appreciate that. In reference to, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, what was just talked about on page six, um, I agree that we should not be suggesting these be that these be posted because there is specific guidance that they should not be posted, and I'd recommend that we just, that the wording just be changed to uh, many emergency departments, urgent cares, and primary care clinics are using and distributing, and just leave it at that. And then I believe that the blue link there is supposed to be a link to those guidelines. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So the guidelines that those are linked to are, in fact, the California ASAP, Kaiser, Southern California, and L.A. County guidelines, which are identical. Um, and I would just caution against putting wording into the document that says that we shouldn't prescribe long-acting and we shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that because the guidelines were written carefully to include the words generally because there is a terrible access to care problem. And so while usually we don't refill stolen prescriptions and usually we don't do a lot of things, there may be some extenuating circumstances where we do do that. And so um, we don't really want to create a situation where physicians are afraid to do what's the best thing for the patient that they've done careful due diligence. Um, and then they feel like they can't treat the patient for fear of discipline. 
So I think that the guideline, just by linking to them, addresses all those because that, that wording was worked out with the three organizations I just mentioned and multiple other physicians across the state. There's a few other um, counties that have now adopted the identical regulations, or I'm sorry, the identical, the identical uh, rules. So that's my comment on that section. And the only other thing I wanted to say was uh, on page nine, I think. Yes, on page nine, just a quick wordsmithing thing where you talked about not addressed by partial uh, opiate and agonists. It should be opioid, not opiate. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Where? Right there. Opioid. Which should it be? I do interchange, but you shouldn't. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard Reamer, neurologist. Uh, this is minor and just wordsmithing for your consideration, which is on page five. In the first paragraph, it mentions a myriad of other medical conditions with objective symptoms. Symptoms are typically not objective. <laughs> so what I was going to suggest was something to, the, to state that, um, for instance, a myriad of other medical conditions which are manifest with moderate to severe pain congruent with objective signs. Thank you very much. Here. Mm -hmm. with subjective symptoms. Good afternoon, Scott Clark, California Medical Association. Uh, just a, a question about clarity in terms of appendix versus what's in the main text. Uh, I'm still a little unsure as to, uh, I know you mentioned that there's a lot of resources referenced that shouldn't necessarily, you know, be considered the, the rule of the land, but um, there are some things that are more detailed or there's some things that are cited in the main body and others that are discussed in the appendix. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to how a physician should interpret that in terms of which is, uh, what is most important that they, that they follow? I think what is most important is the actual text that precedes the appendix. We, and we recognize that there are documents in the appendix that, for lack of a better word, don't comport 100% with each other. But th the goal was to provide as much different information and the variety of information to physicians to have quick access to in order to make the best treatment decision. So that was our thought process, but we're certainly wanting to entertain um, concerns about that because we do realize there are a couple situations where it says one thing, one place, and a little bit different someplace else. So. Okay. Other resources, right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Moving on. We tried to do that in the preamble, but apparently we were not successful, so we will keep working at it. So are we ready to move on to patient evaluation and risk stratification? Again, in this section, we clarified that the recommendations are intended for the long-term opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer pain. We made some formatting changes to make the section flow a little bit better. Uh, we moved the psychological evaluation uh, underneath the completing a medical history and physical examination. Um, we elaborated a bit regarding non-opioid therapeutic options and informational links. And we heeded some excellent feedback about um, individuals who might be prone to um, fix a test so that they look uh, normal. And so we moved that to make its own bullet and not specific to any one particular test. That's right. Are there any comments about this section? So I have a question. Does someone else have a question first? It's, I mean, <laughs> Within the pain, within the patient evaluation and the risk stratification and the pain contract, which I know is a separate document, should there be the consideration that maybe these two documents should be closer in the, in the guidelines so that doctors might want to consider while they're doing their evaluation to maybe at the same time discuss the, um, a pain contract? So I, I don't know. I, I don't 
have any knowledge of what doctors do. I, I don't use pain. I, I'm, I'm not a person who has ever used a pain contract, but I think they're excellent ideas. My concern is, while discussing with the patient what is going to go forward, should the patient not be informed that maybe at the same time they might be subject to the rules uh, under which a pain contract would operate their treatment? So I don't know what's best or what's better or necessary, but I just wanted to raise that issue. Yes, Dr. Snook. The, the issue is that we have uh, what everybody's calling an epidemic in opioid misuse and abuse. Um, in my travels, I find my colleagues are, you know, being the good physicians that they are trusting of their patients. And what we're throwing at them now is stuff they're not comfortable with, and that is basically having an understanding with the patient from the get-go. This is chronic non-cancer pain that we're emphasizing here, that there is a structure that the doctor and the patient have to work together within. And that does include an opiate or a controlled substance agreement. There's all kinds of things in there that, that are in that agreement, including driving and, you know, using heavy machine, all kinds of things, testing, compliance, all that stuff that ideally is addressed early before you, before you initiate opiate treatment. Now, you know, again, I've said before, I'm an end-stage user, so when people come to me, it's a condition of treatment that we will do these things today, or we're not going to go further. We're going to do urine drug testing. We're going to sign an agreement. We're going to do all that stuff. I don't want to take my practice and generalize it out to the state, but one of the big problems that I've become aware of, if you fail to do urine drug screening prior to initiating opiate therapy, you're missing a significant number of patients who are really in need of a brief screening inventory referral to treatment at that time. That may be the first time somebody said, look, you know, there's another issue here. There's meth in your urine or there's alcohol metabolites or there's this, that. All these things that we've noted in the, treat in the, in this, in the body of this document are high-risk behaviors. So what we're really doing is raising the consciousness of the prescribing community, which is primarily primary care physicians, really, the bulk of the people that are involved with this, and, and, and saying, look, you know, you really need to consider these things. So that's kind of the conceptual framework for chronic non-cancer pain. So let me, let's, let's just stay on this for a second. If I'm the patient and I'm coming to a doctor and I'm going to, and I have pain and I'm going to be needing to be treated and the doctor is going to choose whatever the best treatment that they feel is the best for my situation, at the same time there is a need or there will be a use of opioid prescription meds. Should I not, as the patient, be aware of the fact so that I can chit-chat with my friends and say, can you believe the doctor asked me this? And boy, I think, you know, I, I was, I, had I known, I might not have asked for, you know, I not, might not have, you know. Is it an opportunity to also educate the public by having that conversation as, as well as other prescribers, as other physicians that we have to assume everyone is innocent until proven guilty, except we have proven that that doesn't work in this situation. So what can we do? with the population at large to understand that this isn't really about maybe your behavior, but the person that comes in, you know, at the end of the day or you know, that, it, that it does go on. And we may be not needing to do this for you specifically, but this is part of the standard of care today. Thank you. And that's an excellent question. And that's why uh, Howard Height and uh, the other guy, I forgot his name, <laughs> came out with this paper on universal precautions for opiate prescribing. So and they, they adapted that from the HIV epidemic where we adopted uh, universal precautions for body fluid exposure. You adopt universal precautions in prescribing controlled substances so that we can bend the curve, as a term has been used, on the epidemic that we have. So everybody gets urine drug screening. Everybody. There's no exceptions. That's a universal precaution that we apply in the practice of, of prescribing controlled substances. So it's not personal. It's part of a safe practice, uh, you know, in my cohort of patients. And, and that's what we're looking at um, in large part for treatment guidelines for all the prescribing physicians in California so they understand. Now, the beauty of this document is a public document. Everybody can look at it. 
Yeah, the same with the uh, DWC guide, treatment guidelines, the public document. Everybody can go online, they can access it. That's why we want internal, internal consistency across patient populations as best as possible. And we want to have an educational uh, format for everybody. And, and it's critical when you're doing chronic pain management, all the practitioners realize, you know, it's one patient at a time, one physician, one patient, one unique, one unique treatment objective for that patient. You absolutely have to partner with them. So I can't conceive of a circumstance in my practice where we don't have that conversation. You kind of have to have it. You know, hopefully that's the direction that we're moving in with, with this document. Dr. Levine? <laughs> uh, the notion of universal per guidelines before any prescription being written, would you include in that, um, I know that's not part of your practice, but for example, I think one of the things we see is that many you chronic users of opioids begin with an acute episode. So should a surgeon who anticipates using an opioid for post-op pain do a urine screen prior as part of the pre-op visit? Okay, excellent question. And pains were taken in the redrafting of these guidelines to address that very issue. And, you know, we got together with, the emergency, with our emergency department colleagues to address that because it's not appropriate to do urine drug screening on everybody all the time. We're talking about chronic non-cancer pain. That's a distinct population and not the likely population that general surgeons are going to be running into. Uh, it's a unique population with special needs with, 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 in that population, maybe universal precautions are appropriate. But in the treatment guidelines, we talk about acute pain, you know, acute on chronic pain, that sort of thing, surgical pain, perioperative pain, different population of patients. I'm not saying that everybody that gets prescribed this, or controlled substance has to have a urine, urine drug screen. My patients do. That's not everybody. And there's a time frame attached to that, too. There's, uh, you know, a period of time, months or weeks or something like that, wherein maybe it's not the initial prescription. It's certainly not necessarily a prescription in an emergency department. It's certainly not, uh, you know, a five- or ten-day supply of a medication in an acute injury situation. And I think that's stated in the, in the guidelines, and we can certainly embellish that. Yeah, I just, to make, I just wanted to clarify that, in fact, that's what you were saying when you are talking about universal guidelines. It's, it's called universal precautions when appropriate. So any more comments on that section? So you've got that. Okay. okay. Moving on to consultation. So we move the entire consultation section to follow the patient evaluation and risk stratification uh, pursuant to an excellent suggestion, and that was to emphasize that consultation is better sooner than later and that a physician really... Uh, does not have to and should not wait until something goes wrong before seeking a consultation. Any comments there? Okay, treatment plan and objectives. Are we okay? I, I'm just trying to, to take the old guidelines and <laughs> the new guidelines, and I don't know. I've got lots of comments, but I'll give you my comments later, I guess, if I can't find them. Treatment plan and objectives. Uh, again, we clarify the guidelines are directed um, to physicians using opioids for long-term treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. And other than that, the section remains the same. Patient consent. Oh, sorry, any comments on that? No? No? Okay. I, I just want to just... Okay. The statement that you have in there, the effect of pain relief improves functioning, whereas addiction decreases functionality, is like the key to everything. So somehow, I don't know if you want to eventually pull out sentences that are, or statements that are really bullet points that people need to feel comfortable in and wrap their arms around, but I just have to tell you that that really resonated with me tremendously. Okay. I wanted to thank you for that. Okay, patient consent. We refine this area to omit redundancies and again clarify that the focus is on the treatment of long-term chronic, um, long-term opioid th therapy for chronic non-cancer pain. And we also added the risk of, specific risk of respiratory depression. Any, any comments on that section? Okay, next section, pain management agreement. We 
exchanged the word contract for agreement and clarified that a pain agreement should be considered at the time of the third visit within two months. We also added a bullet about the patient's agreement to share information with family members and other close contacts on how to recognize and respond to an opiate overdose, opioid overdose, including administration of an opioid antagonist, such as naloxone if necessary. And we removed the sentence about the physician's co-prescription of naloxone um, and included uh, we're going to include in the appendix a sample or appendices a sample of a pain agreement that contains language regarding overdose management. Any questions there or comments there? You have a comment in the back. Um, it, just for consideration, again, uh, Washington State um, moved forward with a pretty bold program uh, regarding, uh, regarding their um, opioid prescriptions, and part of it was in ED information exchange. Uh, it just made me think of part of this agreement, and I don't know how the, the other clinicians feel about it, but as this is solely from an ED perspective, whether these agreements could be shared with the local EDs. Um, Washington State has a complete ED information exchange so that that primary care provider can provide the local EDs, hey, this is their treatment plan, this is their past medical history, this is what works for them, this is what doesn't work for them, and it kind of closes the loop as opposed to the ED physician just guessing and dropping some dilaudid on the patient in an attempt to discharge. Now, this may be, it's, Washington ASEP put out um, a best practices paper and informa information sharing was one of them. Um, while some physicians may not have the capability, it'd just be a suggestion to consider. So don't go away yet with the microphone. The idea of shared information is excellent. The idea that, um, that doctors could share with other doctors that are treating the same patient, that's even more amazing. But as a practical situation, how would you suggest it work? Only because, for example, in Los Angeles, if you're a Cedars doctor, not operating in the Cedars buildings, but uh, operating within two or three miles in other offices, you don't really always have access to medical records. They don't, they, there's not enough capacity. I mean, there's other institutions. So I would love to know how doctors could share with EDs, or how, how could there be, with the HIPAA violations, with all the other, how, how could that happen? What would you recommend? Well, if you're actually, uh, in direct care of that patient in the ED or the office, then HIPAA kind of goes away. It, it doesn't apply because you are actively um, caring for that patient. So you're allowed the information that's pertinent for the reason that they're there in front of you. Um, in terms of the sharing, um, again, this is in Washington and Oregon State. Uh, they have about 96% of the hospitals in Washington, and I think they're at like 65% in Oregon right now, adding on more EDs. They're all connected through a single information exchange. Hmm. It's called EDIE, E-D-I-E, -E, ED Information Exchange. And it's literally a data repository that's under high security, and it only triggers if the patient registers in an ED, and for no other reason. That's it. Um, so it has to meet very specific criteria um, uh, for it to trigger um, a notation, and whatever the the physician, the primary care physician allows to be accessed is provided to the ED physician in real time. Um, so they register in the ED, it goes to the data repository, it comes back to the ED physician, and if there is a pain agreement, that comes with the mm. information. Interesting, so thank you. They're exploring this in Los Angeles County right now in the San Fernando Valley. They have about 11 hospitals who have uh, agreed to pilot a program like this. Dr. Levine, and then. I mean, I think that is a wonderful description of a future state where we have a functioning health information exchange, um, you know, beginning with a local community like Los Angeles is trying to establish. I mean, I think putting it in here uh, in anything other than. Oh, yeah, no, I was just um, curious. You know, a desired future state, I think, would be very problematic. Certainly, if you're seeing a UCLA physician and then you show up at the UCLA, UCLA ED, they have access to your records. 
Um, and so there's there's ability to get to access it, that information. I think California, given its size, <coughs> complexity, and the unevenness of uh, health information exchanges distributed across the state, it's a it's a ways away from our being able to do anything like That's that. That's a great idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. Hopefully, one day we'll get there in our lifetimes. Okay, I apologize. Continue. No more comments? Oh, Dr. Oh, Green. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. On uh, page 12, um, the physician is responsible to be available or to have a covering physician available to care for unforeseen problems and to prescribe scheduled refills. Just kind of a corollary comment on that. Um, as uh, a member of a 750 uh, physician group uh, with um, pockets of uh, health care centers in Northern California, it's not uncommon that a physician has engaged in a contract with the patient and he's covered by 10 of his partners who are unaware that he's prescribing opioids uh, and uh, may not have the same philosophy uh, uh, in the prescription of these medications. So uh, physicians run into problems when they then go on vacation or they're uh, not on for the weekend and they're not available. I don't know how the guideline can fix that or highlight that, uh, but I think it's important because in, in my conversations with the boots on the ground in our medical group, this becomes an issue. And so um, uh, it, it may be underscoring that it's the responsibility of that physician who engages in that contract to ensure that there is uh, appropriate coverage uh, in their absence. Uh, it otherwise leaves the other physicians feeling extremely uh, vulnerable. So, so you're saying that you think you'd like to see a little bit of revision that last bullet point, strengthening it perhaps just a little bit? So make sure there is a, an individual that they can, when you're out of town, unavailable. Yeah, just something, something that provides that backup. Or, you know, there's a turnover. A uh, physician is fired or they leave the medical group. And, uh, eight remaining family doctors now take over that medic the treatment for the, that patient population. They're, they're engaged in uh, these issues. They've inherited those patients, which I'll comment on later. But this, this is a, a, a true problem uh, in larger medical so but you, you're describing the situation of eight or ten doctors in a, in a practice, and I'm hearing from the back of the room that hospitals in the San Fernando Valley are getting together and sharing information. Do doctor's offices not share patient records in no. the same practice? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in our practice, there's a, there's a shared electronic health record. It's just that a physician runs his own practice with his own uh, patient population. He may have practices that different or philosophies that are different uh, in terms of uh, the prescribing of opioids compared mm -hmm. to the eight other partners. But he would have the records available, Absolutely. or she would have the records available Absolutely. for the patient regardless of their philosophy. Yeah. My concern is that patient who's inheriting that, pa that, that patient or uh, leaving them vulnerable. Now, now, now stuff to provide these room fills or be concerned about uh, opioid control. So um, I... So I, I just want to be clear on something, that if, if a doctor were to leave a practice and the patient is still in the practice and a prescribing situation were to arise, the patient or, or the, the community shouldn't expect a, a new exam is done and a new record medical record keeping is reviewed and a whole new beginning is started all over again cyclically? That would be the appropriate response. Right, okay. So I just want to make sure that rules didn't change because doctors left, okay. Sir, in the back? Yeah, I'm a little confused with that statement because the contract is two ways. If the patient calls a covering doctor and asks for additional pain medication, it's clearly said in that contract, not supposed to be Exactly. Pay. The patient violated it, and right. it's going to be discovered, and the patient is discharged. Right. So I think you're adding a lot of responsibility on the physicians where it belongs to the patient. That's what contracts are for. You sign a contract, you call a physician, another physician seeking drugs, you got the drug, you violated the contract, you're dismissed. I think that the way the sentence reads currently is that it's the doctor's responsibility to be available or to have a covering physician available for unforeseen situation. I don't think the unforeseen situation is 
quite what we're describing over here on this side of the aisle. I think that you're speaking about a, a doctor that's left the practice in, in a new situation, but I think that the, um, the agreement is pretty specific. I think that you're, you, I think you're both, we're talking about two different kind of, two different situations. But I agree with you, sir. Right. I think that the statement here does protect that situation. It, it doesn't suggest that on an ongoing situation that the doctor is going to be responsible for what some other doctor has suggested. In that final bullet point, could there be an opportunity to separate the um, join unforeseen problems and to prescribe scheduled refills? I think there's a implicit expectation that as a physician taking over or covering, then I'm obligated to provide the scheduled refills, and I oh, believe I that that's Dr. Reamer's issue. So maybe we just remove the, the prescribed scheduled refills out of there. Or you could add the word, if appropriate, if deemed appropriate. There's, there's a number of fixes for it, just to make it a little more open-ended. Okay, I'm going to put brackets around that. We'll figure that out. Good. Good points. Any more comments? Search. Sorry. So, I mean, I recognize this problem. I don't have a solution to it, but frequently what I see in the emergency department is patients come in and they say, my pain control doctor has their answer machine that says, if there's an emergency, go to the emergency department. That's, and, and they may have somebody on call, they may not, but it's a difficult practice because a lot of these patients are very demanding and they don't actually really require being cared for at 2 in the morning for a refill of their medications or because their dog ate their homework or whatever the other reason is. And while we would really like to have all that information, there is no feasible way to do that in 2014 and probably not in the next couple of years. I mean, hospitals within internal networks are having good sharing of data and information and we do that within the system I work in, but it, it can be very difficult and there's just no really great solution for that. I mean, I'm always pleased but surprised when a patient actually brings in their pain contract with them, um, which would be ideal. Of course, oftentimes it's a contract that's crumbled up from four years ago, and I'm pretty sure that the reason they're there is because their pain management doctor has dismissed them from the practice for not being compliant. But these are problems that we're not going to be able to address in this document because the technology and the communications are just not that good right now. And I think that the kind of the caveats early on and in the LA County and the California ASAP um, guidelines that you're supposed to try to coordinate care within reason, but you have to allow physician judgment, that's the best we can do in 2014. I, I just want to comment. I think a lot of what I'm hearing is people are, are a little frightened that these guidelines might restrict them and make them liable for disciplinary investigations and action. I want to address this to Ms. Sweet. I don't think that's the intent of these guidelines to catch somebody out. I think as long as a physician, tell me if I'm wrong, I think as long as a physician uh, outlines their specific reasoning behind certain things they've done and it's clearly rational reasoning and under those circumstances it's, it's rational and reasonable that I don't believe that they would be likely to be subject to, uh, to unreasonable search and seizure. <laughs> No, that's, that's absolutely correct, and that's why we added even more to the preamble addressing how, you know, that a peer reviewer, the things that they are required to consider to determine whether or not the standard of care has been breached and more of a definition of the standard of care to allay those concerns specifically. Yeah, I think we're just trying to, we're more, more, we're more trying to keep people out of trouble than to catch them out and get them in trouble. So that's, I think that's the... the the whole gestalt behind this. And it, it's difficult, I find, to, to come up with some specific language, as you've alluded to, in a, especially in a shifting world, uh, as to, that, would, that would take care of all possible eventualities. And uh, it's just not possible. So I think that's the intent, at least. There was a question in the back, I think. Yes, um, I hate to get back to the same thing, but I think prescribing schedule details should be removed because that's not a job of a covering physician. And that's not that's a responsibility of the patient to make sure they get it when during office hours. Yeah. Right here. Maybe just split the sentence. <coughs> you have schedule legal, and you're irresponsible, and you wait till Saturday when the office is closed, you know, it's not reasonable for a covering physician to provide you the schedule legal. I know I don't. So you're suggesting that in a exactly 
and that add to the prescribed schedule details of the needs of the kids. But this is, okay, within the section, okay, let's just take a look. Within the section we're looking at, that's the pain management agreement, that document, that if the patient for some reason needs to see the doctor, the doctor has to be available. And the doctor has to be available or, or have someone else cover that patient in order to care for the unforeseen situation that might occur with that patient. That includes for that doctor to be able to prescribe medication that they are prescribing. Is that what I, I, the sentence is? That's the way I'm reading it. And you're suggesting that the sentence is um, repetitive. Well, the should not be unforeseen. Right. It's contradictory. I don't think you should be taking the drugs at all, but you know that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Levine, I think we're I think we're just defining available to cover covering physician. You could be covering for someone on maternity leave. We're not talking. You're about not about the. You're not talking. About, she's exactly right. You're not talking about the the doctor who is in charge of this patient. You're talking about the person that's going to cover for the doctor in an unforeseen situation. So you may have a, a prescription that needs to be refilled. It occurs during a, a leave for some reason that is longer than the weekend or the night, and the covering physician. I mean, you may want. Perhaps it needs to be separated into pieces, but it should not. I mean, it should not, this should not suggest that a covering physician cannot, with access to records, which a covering physician should have, prescribe scheduled refills. So you could cover the sentence by just taking out the last part and suggest that, uh, or have a covering physician available to care for any unforeseen problems that might occur with a patient. Period. Period. Which may, might include. Uh, which would include then, right. by supposition, whatever is necessary, prescribing or not. People, I don't know. I, I agree with that because when you add it in like that, you know, 90% of the time it will be on the weekend. And that's what, that, that, but, that's but, what but, it turns out to say. Hey, you're in the proper position. It says right here that you are supposed to prescribe. But this is a workplace problem situation. This is something that the medical board shouldn't, I don't think, quite be involved in. But in a workplace situation where you have multiple doctors treating, uh, collaborating in, as far as treatment, that if a doctor were to go away, they would find someone to cover for their, those patients, that that doctor, the new doctor that is going to be covering for that doctor is just filling a void, basically. And if part of that filling of the void would be in addition to holding hands with a patient, it might also mean that they have to prescribe. But the whole purpose is to avoid, but this whole document is to uh, avoid um, misuse and... Absolutely. But one of the biggest goals doctors have is a covered physician being demanded to provide narcotics. And, and you know, when you put in, you know, I think it should just be left a period after the doctor's in the problem, and the rest of it will be deleted. So either a period or a broadening of the prescribed scheduled refills statement needs to happen. So either one or the other. Either you broaden the statement and just it would be a, an umbrella kind of a situation. All, all situations that the, the covered doctor will now deal with whatever is necessary. We, don't, we shouldn't have to tell a doctor who's covering a patient what needs to be done or doesn't need to be done. I think that doctors should know what they have to do when they're covering for a colleague, right? I mean, don't you guys know what you're supposed to do with us, without us telling you? So it could go either way. So you've heard the, okay. Yes, sir. Why don't you just split in two bullets? Make one for unforeseen and one for covering prescriptions. You just say covering, or the um, scheduled prescriptions in accordance with, you know, the policies and practices of this practice and the patient. It's a two-way responsibility. The patient can't call it Friday at 5 p.m. for a scheduled prescription it's that they need to be refilled right then. Mm -hmm. The doctor, you know, if they call a week ahead of time, should have the capability to refill that before it comes Friday at 5. Okay, so let's assume it's not Friday at 5. Let's assume that the doctors had to fly out of town on an emergency basis to see uh, a football game. And, <laughs> and, and in leaving the practice because they had to leave town for the week, they forgot about John Smith. The, the, out of the 45,000 patients that they see in a week, they forgot about John Smith. John Smith is now going to be seen by the 
covering physician, and this is just giving the covering the physician the ability to do what they need to do in the absence of the guy who's gone off the football game. So the recommendation is either you tell that person what they need to do or they already know what to do. So if it means dividing the sentence, I'm, I have no problem with dividing sentences or, or adding sentences. But I, I think that we don't need to only assume that it's a person showing up at Friday night at midnight in the ER because the dog ate their homework. There are situations that will occur that a covering physician just wants to make sure that they are going to be uh, to not get into trouble because of what they are doing to for the continuity of care for the patient that they are seeing and i think that that's what this sentence was trying to address but i'm hearing a whole lot of uh, consternation so you guys have to take well, that in consideration how, and fix it let me add this for consideration something to the effect of the physician's responsibility to be available or to have a covering physician available to care for the patient in their absence in accordance with the contract. A contract. I like that. Something like that. We're, we're not requiring anything more of anybody else, the original doctor, whether the contract. And you can even add, modify more if, if this physician feels it's appropriate. Say the contract is something you would never do with a patient. You just don't feel comfortable. I don't think, <laughs> I, I think it's unlikely, a phys I've never seen a physician be disciplined for not prescribing a drug. <laughs> I mean, I suppose it's happened, but usually it's over-prescribing. But, but anyway, just, that's just a thought, just a, another way to look at it, too, where we're... we're interesting idea. It's, it's, it's just a thought. It's good. So, but you'll fix it. We will fix it. We will fix it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready to move on? Sure. <clears throat> okay. We added an entirely new section entitled Counseling Patients on Overdose Risk and Response, which it includes links regarding overdose prevention and management, and we also included information regarding the new law that will be effective January 1st, 2015, allowing pharmacists to provide naloxone hydrochloride without a prescription. Any comments on this section? Yes. I tried to hypertext prescribe to prevent it. It didn't lead me anywhere. Okay. 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 You seen that one? Yeah. That's a good time, I think, to mention too, that because there, we are linking to so many things, and because of the pr potential problem of broken links, we will be checking and monitoring the document um, to address those types of issues. So. Thank you for, for raising that. Okay, next section, initiating opioid trial. We added uh, data from the troop study regarding the finding that over half of persons receiving 90 days continuous opioid therapy remain on opioids years later. A segment was added regarding administering opioids as well as a small paragraph on addressing breakthrough pain. And we cleaned up a little of the, the verbiage we removed the words in most cases because it didn't make sense. Invariably. Any comments on that section? Oh, I try not to. I had a... Yes. Uh, Megan Maddox with the California Pharmacy Association. You too. Um, we, we did you know. want to thank you very much for your report. Uh, we had several members who reviewed it and we're quite impressed um, with the thoroughness, so thank you so much. We did have one member who is a pharmacist um, specializing in, in pain and did review a little bit over the um, MED and raised a few concerns. And I know you had acknowledged um, about the uh, calculations, but our um, pharmacist who reviewed this um, did state that he had concerns around um, this area and suggested to actually provide or endorse a calculation, um, a conversion calculator, if the board is going to use an 80 milligram MED. Um, he said the language can reflect that the calculator is uh, not endorsed for clinical use, but um, for the compliance with the guidelines. And I do have more of his statements here that I can provide to you. Don't we have that on page 15? 
Yes, that is the, page 15. The calculate, the right, right. I think, I th believe that his concerns was that based off the troop study um, and around that the 80 milligrams, um, if the board is going to use the 80 milligrams MED, suggested to endorse an actual conversion calculator. So that the oh. calculator that's being used is only going based on that versus any other data information? Right. So I didn't know. I'm just asking. For a, for a conversion calculator to meet with the guidelines, but as, as not to be limited, limited to. Okay, interact. And I, and I can provide these. He has a few more statements to you guys. Okay. Please. I'm not quite sure what she said. But Thank you. More. <laughs> so it means that we're using data to maybe not write the right data. Any other so comments? Yes. It yellow flag warning. It's not even a red flag. I don't know if the answer is because there's a typo in the last line of page 14. You can't be right. <laughs> Which word is misspelled? 2, 3.6 is the different drugs that can't be the same. Yeah. I don't know. No, they're different. Because there's, there's one we'll down here. definitely yeah. check that out. Careful not to exceed the recommended max dose of acetaminophen of 3,000 milligrams a day. Yeah. So when I learned it, you could safely give four grams a day. Uh, LD50 was seven grams, and toxicity starts at 10. So I'm just curious: are we just choosing a more conservative? If we're putting this in the guidelines and giving it to providers, etc. Someone gives four grams a day, or they, you know what I mean? I'm just. I'm. Super glad because that's one thing we definitely wanted to put out to everybody because we do have the 3,000 threshold and the 4,000. If you so. kill people with Tylenol, you won't kill them with opioids. I don't understand. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's more conservative. I think the point was to be more conservative, correct? Well, we, we <coughs> actually have a statement from a, a newsletter where we, we have the two, the divergence, and we were going to address this via a footnote was one of the ways we were thinking about approaching it. But again, it's, it's as Dr. Snook stated, one patient per time. So just by virtue of the fact with the, the way these cases end up, so let's say a physician does exceed that amount, but they're doing liver function tests, they're closely monitoring the patient. They're, it, it's, you know, when you have that kind of hardcore statement like you were previously addressing, physicians want to use their best judgment and the totality of circumstances will be evaluated by a peer expert. Well, perhaps you'd put on here examples. Uh, uh, caution is advised when exceeding uh, the recommended maximum dose of 3,000 milligrams per day. Um, and you might actually mention something about may consider uh, liver function testing, et cetera. I think that, I think, um, that needs to be fleshed out just a bit because it was inconsistent and just we need to flesh out that because I have seen in, in disciplinary cases where that maximum has been referred to in the disciplinary uh, case. So I think we want to be careful. Because we, this this number. Once there's a number out there, people will use it, for good or bad. Should we even narrow it more so that there should be some kind of link to some <coughs> kind of entity? I don't know if it's who does decide what is too much or too little. I don't know who does, but someone must decide. Yeah. And if someone FDA, so should there be some kind of a link to the FDA and and the suggestion made that that this document is as is it this information is changing and to be sure of what is the appropriate. You might want to be double checking on on that, sir. Well, you know, there is an evolving. Um, there's lots of different of opinions about what's safe and what isn't safe. The ADMED is a yellow flag warning. It's what that is—a yellow flag. It just says caution. Uh, any prudent physician, you go back to the Medical Practice Act, you know, what would a prudent physician do in, in a similar circumstance? Right. You know, obviously, if we put a number down, somebody's going to use that as, a, okay, well, you exceeded that, you know. So there's sprinkled throughout this treatment, treatment guideline is a lot of leeway for physicians to do things. It doesn't say you must do 
you know, a GTT test uh, every six weeks on people that are on acetaminophen exceeding three, three grams a day. It doesn't say that, uh, you know, because you're going to get pushed back by the payers and everybody else. So you want, you want what is a reasonable thing to do. You want to allow for that. You don't want to necessarily mandate it. You know, the clinicians of, amongst us re recognize that Tylenol is a very important, over-the-counter, inexpensive analgesic. Right. It, it really is. And, you know, in this day of costs, uh, you know, the, one of the major drivers of cost care is pharmaceutical costs. It really is. So we do not want to continue to move away from generic, over-the-counter, inexpensive, highly effective analgesics. So, you know, I'd, like I said previously, it's important. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Rummers pointed out, uh, you know, CDC information and the FDA being worried about hepatotoxicity. And again, it, it, it has to do with your risk stratification, which we bring up here. And so I, I think we've kind of addressed that and given examples and said, look, you know, this is why the, you know, we, an MED uh, calculator is not endorsed. There's an incredible number of them if you Google this, and they're all kind of slightly variable. but. You know, the treating physician will say, well, gee, how much, is, what's the MED, uh, you know, 50 micrograms of fentanyl? They might be surprised. Or, you know, I'm giving uh, 8 milligrams of dilaudid. What does that mean? So if they actually go through the calculation, then they recognize I've already achieved that threshold. And most of the prescribers aren't aware of that. I'm, I'm pretty confident. Interesting. So then this is raising the consciousness. You need to be cautious about what you're doing going forward. Not you can't do it, but you need to be a little bit more aware. That's the whole point through this whole document is you need to be aware and you need to be careful and you need to be smart and you need to keep records. And I think once you do that, then, you know, that's what we're trying to just achieve and raise that uh, level of consciousness with everybody. Um, just FDA in July of this year mm -hmm. asked manufacturers to limit the amount of acetaminophen in combination products to 325 milligrams and reasserted the maximum daily dose of 4,000 milligrams. So this is, the 3,000 is a more conservative, mm -hmm. but the maximum dose approved by the FDA is safe, depending on patient characteristics, is 4,000. Hmm. So it sounds like we should say something to the effect of use, use caution if exceeding the FDA recommended daily dose of 4,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. Just use caution or? Okay. Okay. And that's today. You don't know what the rule's going to be next time they, okay, they decide. Right. And that, that, was, that was sort of something we talked about last time was that in this case now you're modifying somebody else's example that you're citing. And so last time we talked about how quickly these things change, how, how they're, they're, you know, not every situation, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of variability here line by line. So that's why including a list like this can lead to confusion, I think, that we're hearing right here, is that it's an example from one situation and it's set in time. And that's why we've advocated that possibly, you know, uh, you know, it's making, making more clear that this is a, uh, I think you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it, to do something less prescriptive here. To, well, even an example is less prescriptive. Yeah, above the examples, there's a couple things, a couple of disclaimers. So I think they've done that adequately. But I do think this is concerning to me when it says, be careful to not exceed the recommended maximum. They're, they're, you're telling people what they should not do then. So I, I think this line in specific could use some modification. Um, we might consider just how we want to do that. Because um, that, that did concern me too. Fair warning. So I believe, Dr. Snook, did you say that you periodically will exceed that significantly once you've done liver testing and you monitor it consistently and you're confident there's no hepatotoxicity coming on, going on? I do, but you don't want everybody to do it. No. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. <laughs> don't use him. Don't hold him up no, as okay. an example. Well, I, I guess saying that, that being said, just to help our, our folks out, would people here agree with the statement to the effect, maybe leave this out of this example, but something, use caution if prescribing greater than X amount? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. It's important. Are you ready? 
Okay. 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 Under the um, subset of dosing for opioid naive patients, um, we remove the reference to tramadol and Ultram uh, not showing up on cures since it's now a Schedule Four drug. And then again, under the morphine equivalency do dosing, we acknowledge there are variances among reputable organizations and that, again, we recommend the yellow flag warning proceeding with caution and not prescribing um, the actual amount. And then the addition was the links to the two MED calculators. Under ongoing assessment, we tried to organize this so it was clear and we added a section regarding opioid rotation. Any comments about that? I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> under compliance monitoring, under the sentence referencing cures, we omitted the uh, new patient uh, refer a reference since this really didn't uh, make sense at this point of the document. We added additional information regarding the inconsistency of laboratory data and limitations on urine drug testing. For example, there's no way to tell how much of a drug is in the system or when the last dose was taken and the value of t testing blood levels. We acknowledge the potential for cost barriers for laboratory testing and reference the existence of CLIA waived office drug testing kits. And we clarified the suggested responses for physicians sus suspecting versus confirming evidence of diversion. I will. And we what, is, what is CLIA for someone ignorant? Uh, CLIA is Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. Okay, thank you. Oh. And um, we clarified the suggested responses for physicians suspecting versus confirming evidence of diversion. And we acknowledged that the severity of the patient's breach should govern the physician's response. That was not <coughs> clear in the uh, sep September version, so we tried to refine that a bit. Any comments on that section? So I, I just want to ask, Only because I'm looking at notes that I've got. I apologize. Sure. Um, after the pill counting section, but I'm not finding it in the news, so I don't know. Page 17. So I have it on the 16 on the old. Okay. With the evidence of misuse, prescribed opioids demands prompt uh, intervention by the physician in that section. Are we there yet? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so my concern was on um, to caution when terminating contracts. Are you on the new one or the old? The, I'm on the old one trying to look for it in the new. Okay. So are we there yet? Because we, we changed it quite to, a bit. We so we're not there yet. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. Yeah, we are. Look at the new page 17. Yeah, I'm looking at new page 17. I see pill counting. You're talking oh, about so discontinuation. Oh, so continue. I'll wait till you finish that. Okay. Because okay. yeah, that's where I have an issue. Yeah. Well, and it... Oh, okay. It's actually the top of 18. It starts at the bottom of 17, but it's actually the top Okay, so let me tell you what my concern is, okay? Okay. Then you can figure out if it goes there or not. So the caution when terminating a contract or, or a patient, um, a written referral or only treat for the next. My concern is with patients that are being terminated by doctors for um, abuse of the uh, contract or not fulfillment of the, however you want to put it, they don't fulfill their contract obligations, that somehow the, um, that there maybe needs to be a time constraint that the doctor will not treat the patient uh, unless it's an emergency for the next 30 days while they're looking for another doctor. My concern is that a patient, the patient abandonment issue mm -hmm. and the frustration of the uh, situation that the patient has failed in their commitment or their um, expectation of participating. So I just want to just, that there needs to be some kind of um, protection from the patient as well as for the doctor to have some tools. Are we there? Well, we have the link um, on how to sever or terminate the patient relationship. Okay. Which is under the discontinuing opioid therapy section. Yeah. Okay. So, so then it's not relevant. I apologize. So we're ho no, that's okay. <laughs> so we're, we're hoping that that provides specific information on how well, to go about doing that. I, I understand why you would get dismissed. I want to make sure that the dismissal it's all, it's all, is protecting. Okay. All the, if it's discontinued, here's how they should do it. 
They have a whole okay. section. Yes. We have a comment under compliance monitoring. Couple. Yes. Um, Doctor, there's one behind you. There's two. Um, just the footnote 13, responsible opiate prescribing, Scott Fishman. Isn't that the State Federation of Medical Boards? That is responsible opiate prescribing. He's the author, but isn't that? Oh, the that's that's uh, Scott Fishman's yes. responsible opioid prescribing. I just prescribing. wanted to complete the citation gotcha. that says State Federation of Medical Boards. Yes. Just an editorial. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Just in the uh, bottom sentence on page 17, it says the pain management contract and or treatment plan. I think you mean agreement. Yes, we do. Thank you. That. Just one issue on page 19. It says physicians be can held, held accountable for patient abandonment if medical care is discontinued without justification. Um, you should not require anybody to see someone they don't like. Um, there's, we don't have slavery in this state. If a physician doesn't like a patient for any reason, he can discontinue it. It should only say physicians should be held accountable if they do not provide adequate provisions for subsequent care. Sure. A physician does not need justification to terminate a patient's care with them. Page 19, third paragraph. We don't have slavery in the state. Um, Sir, I would agree with you we don't have slavery in the state, but I would say from the perspective of the patient and the treatment of the patient that there's an ethical way of dismissing a patient, right. and that might include a, a um, recommendation that they have to find a doctor within a certain amount of specific time and that within a specific uh, cer amount of time they will not be seeing them. I'm just suggesting that there needs to be... Um, that I agree 100%, but that's not what the sentence says. A physicians can be held accountable for patient abandonment if medical care is discontinued with just, without justification or adequate provisions. It should be said that physicians can be held accountable for patient abandonment if adequate provisions for subsequent care are not made. Mm -hmm. Are you saying turn it around and put it in a positive situation? That they should not be required to provide justification why they um, dismiss the patient. Carrie, is there something in the statute fix that. regarding that? I think the dismissal is based on a not, a not holding up your end of the um, contract, the uh, non contract, the agreement. The issue is not that doctors can or can't see their patients, but if you've got a pain management agreement between the doctor and the patient, and the patient has negated their responsibility, there's a way that you can remove that patient from your roster, but at the same time, without just walking away, slamming the door, and, and saying goodbye. I wonder, my point. Do, our do our lawyers here have any... Uh, Anything they can comment on? Is there a thing in this, anything in the statutes as to what it re what's required when you terminate a relationship? Um, you have to look at this further, the, the thing that I'm concerned about is, is that in most situations you would have to provide for adequate leeway for the person to get other care, but there may be some situations, like if there's a threat of violence where a there's a justification for an immediate end to the relationship. See, I would, so. I would, I, what I was suggesting is there, there may be cause for an immediate termination, but within that immediate termination, there is, to cover the base, would be maybe a statement that if it's an emergency, you'll be treated, but otherwise, we're finished. I mean, I'm just suggesting from the perspective of the patient, as well as for the doctor, that there just be a little bit of, of um, expectation of some kind of coverage. That, that we don't see the patient walking into the emergency room because they can't have a doctor treat them because they screwed up. Patients, I'm not giving, I'm not suggesting patients are right. I'm just suggesting that circumstances happen and that I'm just asking that within the inclusion of the statement that in an emergency the patient would be treated for a limited amount of time. And that maybe should be on the agreement and to start with. That if you break this agreement, you are subject to being disciplined, uh, not dis you're, you're subject yes. to being released and dismissed, and we will give you uh, seven days to find another doctor or 30 days to find another doctor or whatever the time frame is rational and reasonable, except in case of an emergency. I'm just asking that there be some kind of... So it's clear that we need to take another look at the sentence and, and we'll do that and, right. and see 
how else somewhere between slavery and, and dismissal there's some, some and, and I do believe that the the link that we have that we can't reach right now because I wish we could take a look at it I do believe it addresses that specifically but I will double check to make certain okay so in the copy that I had read originally there was no link so I didn't yes. check the link so I apologize no so that's why I made the statement on the side of my page which sure. you've heard more than enough from me now sure just to add, uh, there are circumstances besides being threatened uh, uh, or endangerment where you might want to discharge that patient immediately. Uh, so, for instance, stealing or borrowing drugs. Okay. So uh, the f that sentence indicates that if you've stolen or borrowed drugs, I'm still going to provide you enough medication uh, uh, mm. for, mm -hmm. for a period of time, uh, treat the patient until they have had a reasonable time to find an alternative source of care. So. Uh, I think reworking it is a is a good idea. Okay. And I think we had uh, I discussed with Ms. Kirschmeyer and also Ms. Webb the next sentence about fish physicians have an ethical duty to report patients who are obviously diverting drugs to their local DEA office regarding HIPAA implications of that. And I think that needs to be clarified probably because you don't want a physician to have a HIPAA violation. Um, because I have a little article that I got of, that talks about that specific thing. So we want to be cautious not to, for our physicians not to be put in a bind between HIPAA violation, which can be very expensive and damaging, and, and, uh, and board action. Uh, there's another hand or another opportunity. Yes, please. Uh, well, you know. My problems aren't necessarily your problems, but what happens... I'll make them my problems. I'm good <clears throat> at, at taking on other people. What people's. happens when you're a tertiary practitioner like me, and, you know, you see patients that have been ramped up on multiple benzodiazepines, multiple opiates, and as we try to get a handle on that, there's all kinds of outside things, whether it's an injured worker or, you know, what, what the carrier is, how, how they get paid, how do they pay for the medications. If, and if you arrive at a decision that you don't want to take care of that patient anymore, it's, it's not just as easy as, uh, you know, I'm not going to see you anymore. Uh, you know, the current standard in this community is if you violate your agreement, many times the practices will just rip the sheets there and that's it, see you later. Um, that's not really practical. It puts a burden on the emergency, exactly. uh, the whole emergency care uh, uh, and, and also access. So when a patient leaves my practice, they more or less are radioactive. Nobody wants to take care of them. I have, a, I have an ethical duty to manage that patient. Many of them have psychiatric comorbid comorbidities. And when we start reducing opioids, and I think I brought this up at the last uh, meeting, the uh, psychiatric psychological comorbidities manifest. And now I've got you know, angry patients, uh, I have a risk to my staff and all that kind of stuff. There's all these complicated things. So, you know, I have to deal with that and, you know, do a taper. This allows us to do a taper. We so say, we're going to taper you. Uh, I don't necessarily want to say that they're abusing their medications because that's not always fair. It's not always the patient's fault. But I just want to emphasize to everybody, you know, this is not, this is not an easy thing. This is why in addiction medicine we call, about, we call it wrestling the dragon for a reason. These are very difficult, problematic situations, and I just want to make sure that whatever we put into the, uh, this paragraph uh, allows, uh, recognizes and allows the difficulty there is in taking these patients off of, of, off of opioids because it does unmask all kinds of other things and the necessity to do a medically uh, supervised tapering when they're on multiple benzodiazepines. So I'm, I have several patients right now that I basically discharged them and handed them a discharge letter and I'm still treating them because they can't find another doctor. They're on the, all these medicines I'm trying to take. So I'm doing a medically supervised taper while I, after I've discharged them. And, you know, how long does that last? Is it a month, two months, three months? It's wrong. We're, now we're into the between the second and the third month, at least on one patient. And, and, I, and I imagine that's not going to be an uncommon occurrence for many practitioners. Uh, so I just want to bring it up by way of, you I'm know. I'm in the same place you are, kind of, but I'm suggesting exactly the same thing, that a discharge of a patient doesn't necessarily mean that you can't treat them if you want to, but you're obviously not going to be treating them with the same things you were treating them before. 
Exactly. You're going to be treating them either with, with different kinds of either psychotropic meds or less meds or whatever you decide. That's your choice. But I'm just suggesting from the patient's perspective, you don't want them walking out of the office tomorrow and walking into an ER. And so I just wanted to make sure that within this statement here, or you don't want them walking into, into any kind of a emotional breakdown. I mean, I'm just suggesting, and I don't know what could happen. I just was asking that within the context of this, that there was some kind of protection that, that there would be the ability for some kind of a um, continuum of care. That's all. Not that they have to treat, not the doctor has to treat, but that there's a time frame by which or, or a situation train by which the doctor can either hand off or hand out or close the door without creating another monster. Understood. But you, you still, there still is a need to be able to wrestle that dragon over that period of time, even that's, when you've discharged them. That's for them, the professional because to do. That's not for us to do. Commonly, the patient will get mad, you know, they get mad at you. And go through all that stuff, and I'm going to go to another doctor, and then they can't. I know they're not going to find another doctor, so they're going to come back, and I'm going to have to deal with an angry patient, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. That's what I chose to do. I'm not like, oh, you know, feel sorry for me. But I want to have the protections, and, in, in, you know, I want to know what the rules are. That's all it's about. Tell us what the rules are, and the rules have to let us know, yeah, there are populations of patients that are extraordinarily problematic, and it's not reasonable just to give them a month's supply of medicine and, and say it's, you're gone. Without question. Without that's without, not it. No. Yeah, but that's what we used to do. So these guidelines are saying, no, you know, there's this in-between, there's a more prudent, appropriate response to this problematic population of patients, and then we're not going to get in trouble for that. Because, you know, historically, this doctor gets sued is the last doctor that's taken care of the difficult patient. Exactly. I mean, we don't want that to happen. Right. So that, and then it just throws the patient out on the street or into the emergency department. That's, that's not what public policy that we want to have. Exactly. On the same page, good. Thank you. Okay, I think okay. Records. Now we're in the medical records? Yes, we are. I just wanted to make sure. There was one thing I didn't mention that we added into the dis discontinuing opioid therapy, and that's the recommendation that an ex exit strategy be included in the treatment plan to have that thought process already happening and being discussed at the outset of treatment. So I just wanted to emphasize that. So before you continue on to the next because now I found where we were. <laughs> Within the discontinuing of opioid therapy, which is excellent, excellent, excellent. But should it be closer to the section on the treatment plan? I mean, what we're, we've got here are the guidelines for the treatment of the opioid situation. And should the, um, the initial consult, the prescribing of opioids, the me method in which you mo monitor that, should they be more co-located? I don't know, but just, I, just, I don't I'd, know. I'd like to pose the question to the folks in the, the room, because I thought, when I was writing this up, thought that same thing. So, see what you, what, what, what our experts what think. What, okay, you know, okay, what I was <laughs> recommending, no. like Dr. Levine? Forward. Yes. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it does. Okay. I absolutely agree. I'm One thing we might be able to do is just take that sentence out and add it and have it just repeat. We could also add it to the treatment plan. As a as a consideration, and then also keep it in this section so, as well. Yeah. Any other comments on the chronology or lack? No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. I don't need you. Troublemaker. Chapters of the book keep going. Um, I did also want to add that we um, added segments encouraging a physician to investigate the possibility that breaches in the patient agreement might be due to inadequate treatment or cost barriers. Okay, and then on to medical records. We again clarified that the content of a patient's medical records, well, we just clarified the concept of 
the distinguishing between the cancer patient or the acute ca care patient versus the patient being treated on uh, long-term opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. Um, so the contents of a patient's medical records will depend on numerous factors and um, the suggestions cited relating to the physicians, um, the, all the suggestions cited in the medical records section have to do with pay, uh, physicians treating patients for long-term chronic non-cancer pain. And then for clarity, we changed the list from a lengthy paragraph to the bullet format. That was pretty much it for that section. Any comments on that? Yes. Yes, it does. And so what is the basis for us to actually have all access to laboratory tests? I think it's implying the test that the physician actually ordered. The physician who did, who is doing the physical examination that that particular physician ordered. Because I think it implies, and we, we obviously need to clarify, that if laboratory tests upon which the physician is relying are not accessible, that's cause for consideration. So if the patient's telling you I had abnormal tests or I had this, and that's what the physician is, is relying upon in order to prescribe in this particular situation, um, that would be cause for concern. The way I read this, you're making me a in my records for all laboratory tests that patients had, regardless of who's working on them. Well, no. Is part of the record, no. no? No. Okay. Well, we, well, we can fix that. Any others? Comments in this section? Why is the problem? These people typically bounce around and mm -hmm. I know. Okay, we'll move on to the next section and we added a section entitled Supervising Allied Health Professionals uh, for physicians who supervise physician assistants or nurse practitioners who prescribe oh, who prescribe opioids. I'm sorry. It's alright. Yes. Should it also include a review of imaging studies or radiologic information as well? Yeah. Yes. What kind of records? Imaging, like MRI, CT, like ultrasound. I thought that was in there. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing on supervising allied health professionals. We'll move on to the compliance with controlled substances laws. And the um, item we added there was the Board of Pharmacy's presidential corresponding responsibility decision. So that concludes all of the, um, the substance of the primary guidelines. We can now move on to the appendices. Appendix number one. Does anybody have any comments about that? No? Okay. Number two. So I have a question about two. Does anyone have a question about two, pediatrics? Dr. Levine, no questions about two? You're, okay. So my question goes to sports injuries. And um, I don't know that it's addressed anywhere in this situation, but uh, pediatric patients that are playing sports who are injured, do they need a separate, would they maybe need a separate situation when they're treated on the field by their non-attending doctors? Would there be any different rules? Would there be any rules about not being sent back out on the field and given drugs and 20 years later having a 
brain concussion, brain injuries. I mean, I, I, just, don't, I yeah, just, with everything that's um, been going if, on. If you're talking about organized sports, the physicians who sit on the sidelines, um, their determination is generally, um, they do not treat with medication, for example. They'll, they'll mm -hmm. put a Band-Aid on, they'll put a tourniquet on, they will make a determination as to whether the, the, the injured child or, or adolescent can return to safely to play but would not be writing a prescription okay, good. I didn't for, know. for medication on the sidelines or administering anything, including aspirin, I think. Um, They're th really there to do triage and assess the safety of the return of the child to the, to the sporting event. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Appendix three. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory unless anybody has a comment about the, the use of this particular questionnaire. Same with the PQ-9, Appendix 5, the opioid risk tool. date on the opioid risk tool. Oh, on the soap bar. If we get permission. Oh. Okay. Okay. Appendix eight. I hate it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Appendix nine. Appendix 10, Therapeutic Options for Pain Management. A long one. <laughs> Appendix 11, the Non-Opioid Pain Management Tool. Appendix 12, and again, I mentioned we are going to be adding a third suggested pain agreement to incorporate the uh, overdose issue. Appendix 13. Be before you go on, did, did we decide yes or no that, that we should include something at this stage on the agreement with respect to termination? and expectations of both parties on termination. I'm, I don't recall what, what the discussion did. we, as a group, decide that, that we would put that in as a possible add-on add to this agreement? I don't recall. Just a thought. There's your suggested strategies right there. Appendix 14, strategies for tapering and weaning, suggested strategies. Are there any comments about anything we haven't discussed? Yes, Dr. Smith. Just on the... Um, hmm? Suggested, suggested treatment plans. There are um, a couple that were published. I know that Dr. Fishman published one 
way back when. We used to argue about whether it's a contract or agreement. Everybody, would, all the doctors were afraid, you know. So, you know, it took a long time. Whether you do it, you don't do it. So Scott published a um, kind of a standard agreement. It's quite a while ago, but, it, you know, it, just to, um, by way of reference, I think you were going to put a couple of treatment agreements right, in. Right, right. And, and, and then I would agree with the um, exit strategy, maybe as emphasizing that in an um, uh, appendix. I, I think that's a good idea. Okay, because that's that's going to be the most problematic thing that happens, and and once hydrocodone gets, sorry, once hydrocodone gets scheduled, coming like October fifth, I think you're gonna <laughs> we need to be ready for this kind of stuff. Okay. So the sooner okay. the better. Thank we you. will. We'll add. We'll add both, the one incorporating that language as well as uh, Scott Fishman's. You're going to be on. Mm -hmm. I think we're, uh, we're right there, okay? Well, thanks each and every one of you in the audience and our staff for the incredible job and hard work you've all put in. Um, uh, staff will be finalizing the document and we will be presenting it to the board at the uh, medical board at the October medical board meeting in my town, San Diego. Once this document is approved by the board, it will be placed on the board's website and a link will be emailed to all physicians. As previously stated, uh, we do plan to continue this task force. The next, uh, the next issue we want to pursue is looking at best practices. Several individuals have contacted, contacted us on ways to battle the epidemic of prescription drug overdose, and we want to hear those ideas and use them to provide education to our physicians and to the public via our newsletter, website, and other educational opportunities. Again, thank you all very much for participating in no your German. effort. No German. Yeah, I think we have one more comment. I, I didn't finish. You so. almost were there. Okay. <laughs> I have to get to the end. So I want to thank everyone for your, for your effort and your patience <laughs> with trying to get through this. And I understand we do have another comment, so. Please. Timeline. Yesterday. Uh, uh, October, and if it's approved by the full board, I believe it would then, how does that work in terms January? of? January. That's a good question. I think you guys probably are already doing all of this stuff. The object of this is not to tell you what to do or how to do it, but to give you suggestions, right? Well, th these are not regulations. It's not regulations. These, these are so recommendation really guidelines, and they're, you're supposed to use them to the best of your ability. We're not telling you how to practice what you practice, which is called medicine. So uh, I think the object is that we're just trying to – this is another tool that's meant to help practitioners practice the art of medicine and treatment of their patients. So um, I would assume the majority of you are doing something along these lines already, hopefully, and those that are not, that needed extra help in, in what we'd like to see happen. I, I don't think, yes, Ms. Webb. It's approved by the full board and subject to minor changes that right. the executive director would be authorized to make, then it's just a matter of getting it posted to the website. So it would happen very quickly. Yes, that's why I said yesterday. I mean, I was being facetious, but as soon as the board meeting happens, things uh, the clerical errors are fixed and, and changed or tweaked. I mean, it's a work in progress. It's a it's a living um, document. It's it's meant to just provide a foundation for everyone. And as we go forward, and as the rules change, and as F FDA changes their rules, and everyone else in electronic medical records have become more proficient and accessible and available. And as other tools in, of the trade go forward, I think we'll see this will be changed a bit. So we're not coming to check tomorrow if you're doing this or not. And I want to say we do welcome continued input. Sure. Uh, you folks may be more current with literature than we are in certain areas. So please keep us apprised of that because we do want this to be a work in progress and useful for our practitioners and our patients. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Staff, seriously. Thanks, I think
just to that the remark, I just wanted to remind everyone that the, the board has tried to do this over the years. I mean, we did this with the uh, intractable pain task force. We tried to make it so doctors who were dealing with the need to prescribe based on intractable pain were safe and were could do what they needed to do. We've done it with every along the the road, but that public policy and those issues of public policy have to come from our stakeholders, and they come from you. And if, as you see, as you go forward in the practice of medicine, issues that arise, you feel that the medical board can either uh, convene or or educate. Please, you need to. This is a two-way street. This is not us and you, and they and us. And we need to work together because we all live in the state together, and we all either are a patient or a doctor. You know, and the doctors, I guess, one day are patients too. I'm not sure, but you know, we all want the best for everyone here. So I want to thank you all, and thank staff again as well. Thank you. And the meeting is now adjourned.